Thank you. So um, the topic today is going to be five reasons to rethink your social strategy in 2024. Um, really, you know, it may be applicable to your whole marketing, um, but I think we work primarily through the lens of social. So I'm going to talk about it in that way. But I think you'll find a few things, uh, shake loose some thoughts that might apply in a broader way beyond social. So let's with, get it going. So number one uh, reason to rethink your social strategy for next year, and I, I think you've probably noticed, the world has changed. <laughs> and it's changed a lot. I mean, the last 10 years have really been the exception that proves the rule. Um, easy money had a huge impact on the last 10 years. Um, lots of growth in startups, bigger tech companies able to really hire and sort of create a bit of an arms race around uh, certain functions and their salaries. A lot of things sort of made possible by zero interest rates. Um, during that time, social networks uh, became social media and became really hubs for content and media, the starting point for a lot of people's digital experience, uh, where maybe 15, 20 years ago, you'd go to your My Yahoo portal page, and then maybe it started with Google uh, and search for something and you're off to the races these days or until recently. Um, a lot of folks would start their day you know, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and so they really became these sort of kings of content um, and really ascendant over this last 10 years. Another interesting thing that happened uh, while that was going on was that Facebook in particular um, really led the charge uh, for this direct to consumer movement. Uh, these are brands that you know really <laughs> did not have a physical presence in many cases. Some of them have gone on to have that, but they were able to do really low cost uh, acquisition via Facebook ads. And so that really broke open uh, Facebook and the social networks for uh, advertising um, outlets in a way that really hadn't been, um, hadn't taken off to that point. Around 2016, <laughs> signs of trouble, <laughs> things, things getting a little spicy in the land of social media. And then uh, a few short years later, this jerk showed up. <laughs> And this made all kinds of things go screwy. Um, it really sort of had massive impact. I won't rehash all of our pandemic trauma, but one of the interesting things that's come out of that that's starting to impact social media and marketing and online conversations is we had, you know, 2020, we had a lot of social justice uh, protests. We also see that a lot of folks reevaluated their relationship to work uh, during that time. And so have looked for ways to uh, maybe change up that power dynamic, unionization is up. Um, we had a whole round of quiet quitting and the great resignation. So we've been through a lot of employment changes there, but the real sort of trend here is a bottoms up empowerment of the worker. Um, and right on time, there comes the Fed to put an end to the party. So higher interest rates ahead, no more easy money, sad Mark Zuckerberg. So reason number one, everything around us has changed in big ways. The platforms have changed too. They've had to in response to um, some of these different factors. So when we talk about how the social platforms have changed, we're not gonna get far without talking about this guy. So Elon decided either half seriously, totally seriously, not at all seriously, that he wanted to buy Twitter, then he decided he didn't want to buy it, then a court decided that he did want to buy it, and so he did, um, and then set about putting it in the ground. So I think one of the important takeaways is whatever, for better or for worse, whatever you thought Twitter was, um, it, it's, it is done. In its place, we have X. What is X? You know what? Who knows? Only this guy. So we're really seeing that um, this transition for the last year under new management, certainly it's been bumpy. Certainly it's had implications on the platform. Um, and realistically, the best way to think about it is that everything you thought you knew about Twitter and how that worked doesn't necessarily apply to X. But perhaps the most impressive thing that Elon did was make that guy uh, seem less evil. <laughs> he was the reigning champ of evil um, until Elon entered the scene and 
not to be outdone um, in competition to Elon's X, he launched Threads. And Threads promises to bring together uh, the Fediverse or the, you know, all of the other little sites and communities that and Twitter clones that have sprung up um, as folks have decided that they don't want to be part of this uh, X platform experience. Whether or not they ever actually do that or get there um, remains to be seen, but we can't forget that uh, Zuckerberg has a big bat to swing called Facebook and Instagram. So if he wants to think about how to get Threads messages out into the world, um, he's got a, a few really good um, options that don't require him to actually fulfill on that promise to connect all these other federated sites. So while these two are gobbling up most of the scenery, meanwhile, a bunch of other sites, TikTok, YouTube has launched Shorts, which is sort of a TikTok-like experience, Reddit. Uh, these sites get hundreds of millions, or uh, in the case of TikTok, over a billion monthly active users. So there's a large swath of social outlets that have been largely ignored and quietly going about their business, doing the thing they say they're going to do. Um, we've also seen other kinds of content that maybe we historically haven't thought about as social, like podcasts. Everyone knows that during the pandemic, we were all required to start a podcast. We started two, I think three. <laughs> so we've done our part. You need to do yours. Podcasts um, sort of are acting as a, a, a formation for communities, um, as are newsletters. Um, so different things that maybe we didn't think were in the mix for social have started to make their way into the mix as the platforms have changed and that has changed the way that users are interacting with them. Most of us, if not all of us here, are B2B focused and I would say conspicuous for its relative absence is LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn gonna LinkedIn. They have made some updates to their algorithm to try to identify and put people into areas of expertise. Uh, they have put an emphasis most recently on thoughtful and meaningful comments to posts as a way to determine where your expertise may lie. Um, and they have said outright that they feel like whenever a post goes viral, that's a failure of the algorithm. So they are working actively to kind of shut down gaming the system to create posts that go viral, um, much to the sadness of many Thread boys and LinkedIn gurus. So LinkedIn is still there doing its thing, really taking advantage of its incumbent position as the B2B network. Um, but in terms of like product offerings, hasn't been really, hasn't shown any sense of urgency against a backdrop of all of these things going on. So your LinkedIn playbook is probably mostly intact and just needs to be added to where I would think that your Twitter playbook can go into the circular file, um, build a new playbook around X, threads, and the federated sites. So all these changes that have happened here, uh, of course, audience have changed too. So world changed around them uh, and the platforms are changing, which is driving a, a lot of behavior change that we haven't seen, again, for the last 10 years or so. 51% of consumers think that less than half of brands create content that resonates as authentic. So that's a little bit of a tricky stat, but half of people think that half of brands content is kind of crap is a way to think about it. Um, not a great stat as a marketer, but 92% of us think that those consumers are talking about somebody else because we think our content definitely resonates as authentic. Um, Clearly, there's a little bit of a gap there. We can't all be right in thinking that consumers are thinking that about another brand and not us. So why is this content having trouble resonating or reaching audiences in a way that they feel like it's for them uh, or legitimate? Well, one of the reasons is we have this unique situation where you've got three full generations in the workforce. Um, all of them can be in decision-making capacities lots of different variations in terms of potential combinations of values, role, seniority, authority. Uh, it gets really tricky to navigate. And again, being in a B2B space, chances are in a buying committee, you might have one of every kind or more. So we've got a really sort of variety of audiences that we're talking to. Even if we said, oh, I want to talk to the director of IT, that could be 
you know, a 60 year old, a 40 year old, a, a 25 year old. We've got a lot going on there that you can't really think of these audiences as being monolithic or complying fully with just a, a demographic breakdown or something like that. One thing we can all agree on is don't call me. Um, nobody likes to be sold to. All generations hate being sold to. So Kelly Seelig actually was the one who said to us years ago, marketers have really broken the phone. I mean, who answers the phone if you don't know who's on the other side at this point? Um, and we are well on our way to breaking the inbox. Um, I bet everyone on this call has experienced, um, you know, every morning when you come in, an inbox full of, in case you didn't see my prior email, or can you point me to the right person? And so even though this sales motion of get somebody's phone number, get somebody's email address, and then pound them endlessly until they submit um, isn't working, my sense is that folks don't know what to do instead. And so they just keep doubling down on the same thing. One area that's thriving, I mean, you can't fault people for not trying, is uh, market research. So market research spending has doubled since 2008, up to $81 billion. Um, and that's good. We should try to understand the audiences better in order to uh, improve these numbers, frankly. But you know who doesn't do any market research? Artists. Why? because they live with the community that they are trying to create for. And this is one of the takeaways for me is that uh, if we're creating content and we're creating marketing strategies from an arm's length, and we're not really out there in the field with a little mud on our boots to understand the folks we're trying to market to, um, our efforts are really going to fall short of the mark. All right, so the world's changed, platforms have changed. Audiences have changed. And then you knew it was coming. AI has entered the chat. Um, there's really one thing that I want to say about AI. There's a million things we could say, and I want to get into it in the conversation following this presentation. Um, but the one thing that I think is salient for this conversation about AI is that it represents the first genuine threat to Google's dominance in at least a decade. Um, and I kind of wonder how many of us have really thought deeply about our digital marketing strategy beyond Google. What happens in a post Google world? Um, SEO, like why are we creating all this content for Google or for SEO if fewer people use Google over time? Um, if there's a rapid movement away from Google, what happens to your pay-per-click advertising programs? Uh, what happens to the prices first, and then what happens to the effectiveness? So there's a lot of things that come out of considering the implications of a full mode switch from search as the dominant model for finding content uh, and finding information and moving to a more conversational uh, generative AI kind of experience. Before that happens, I would be remiss if I didn't say that we are almost certainly going to be inundated with a wave of very crappy content um, that really covers almost anything that's basic uh, that we used to write, you know, listicles, you know, short how to's, that kind of content is really where things like chat GPT um, excel. So we should let that stuff be done by automation. But um, one of the things that this is going to drive is a need to make our content distinct and show that it's not generated by AI. And so the best way to do that is really going to be to think about how you pull your subject matter experts forward. They are your unique element. They are the thing that your competitors can't replicate. Their expertise is the thing that is, uh, valuable for your customers to tap into and isn't available via either search or chat GPT. So think about who your subject matter experts are. Think about how to arm them with the right kinds of messaging, the right kinds of content. And then most of all, you know, trust your team, uh, let them off the leash, get them out in front of the audience and let them do their magic. And last but not least, do everything with less. <laughs> All of this is unfolding against a backdrop of, you know, these headlines. 
just layoffs, layoffs, budget pressure, budget pressure. Um, I have some stats here that I got from an article by John Miller, uh, the co-founder of Marketo and now with OpenView Partners. It says 71% of CMOs believe that their 2023 budgets were inadequate to fully realize their strategies. And 86% of marketers feel the need to overhaul their marketing to ensure sustainable outcomes. So this is the person who really largely helped write the inbound marketing playbook. Um, and he is saying 86% of marketers think it's time to go back to the drawing board. Um, so if you were hoping that it was a phase, if you were hoping that things would go back to where they were, um, it really doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, so definitely going to continue to have pressure on budgets. And, you know, the the thing that we've all seen happen is, you know, when budgets get cut, everybody says, you know, don't do anything that doesn't directly draw a line to leads. Um, and then you end up, everybody is fishing in the same small pond for the one to 5% of the market that's actually out to buy that solution at that time. And so you find that even your demand gen strategies become more expensive, less effective, because you're dealing with more competition. So the price pressure is going to continue. Um, the layoffs, maybe they're going to turn around. I saw the first headline today or yesterday in the New York Times that Meta is saying they plan to hire next year. Um, so there's maybe a glimmer that says we've reached the end at, you know, 177,000 plus layoffs um, and turning the corner where folks have corrected and are ready to um, start growing again. I want to also just say that the good news here is this doesn't say do more with less. In fact, I would encourage you to do less, period. <laughs> do less and do better um, because we are all going to have to think a lot harder um, in that post-Google world and in the disruptive landscape of social about the content we create, how it's going to get in front of the right people, um, and it's going to take us back to a lot of basics. We're going to have to become more outbound. And uh, we're going to have to think about how to become essential, how to build that relationship with the customer, and also um, how, to, how to renegotiate our relationship with sales. Yes, again. <laughs> so sales are customers, sales are our employees, and sales can be employee advocacy uh, sort of folks as well. So um, in case you thought that you had it finally dialed in, in that sales and marketing cooperation, uh, it's time to go back to the table and work with our counterparts there as well. So to keep on time and get us to the discussion part, because I really want to hear how you all are dealing with these challenges, how you're thinking about that uh, sort of AI post Google world. Um, these are the five reasons uh, that I think you should take a moment to rethink your social strategy for next year. 